Hey, hello, welcome uh, everyone. Thanks for joining. This is the third week of our uh, four week program. So we are uh, 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 more than halfway through. Um, and the topic of today is uh, governance. Um, it is supposed to follow the technical deep dive and that we did last week. This will move more into um, how to land Apogee well in your organization, in your larger landscape of applications. So we look at automation, we look at CICD, we look at governance. And Christoph, if you can click ne next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, this week we have two uh, different experts from the team. Uh, you have already seen uh, some others, but this week there's Christoph from France, from Paris, and there's Maria from Germany, from Munich. Um, and they will, t they will cover the topics of today. Um, my name is Kevin Baumeister. I'm leading the, the, the EMEA-based Apogee team, uh, but I won't be uh, talking as much as uh, these two experts. It's really their knowledge they will be sharing. Um, it, it, to visualize it, it works like this. It's a step up, right? So now we have set the foundation set, the, found, the, the, the kind of the product foundation with two, two uh, first steps. Now we're at on the third step of this, uh, of this ladder, looking at governance. And that's the introduction. So, um, uh, looking forward to uh, support you with uh, with Apogee, and uh, I think this is going to be another great session with a lot of best practice and a lot of good advice to how in, how to take Apogee uh, and how to implement it in a in a in a in a well manner. Right. So with that said, I will shut up and hand over to the first speaker. I think that's going to be Maria. Thank you, Maria, Thanks for taking Kevin, over. But anytime you're more than welcome to speak up so you have a lot of experience <laughs> as well to share so hi everyone i'm happy to be here today uh, of course with christoph so let me start api governance is a very big topic so let us start and have a look on what a great api developer experience requires so first of all it requires great api products where api products are being developed with specific target audiences in mind and this is also leading in the development of APIs with specific API products in mind and not projects or thoughts around you know, the teams managing the APIs or the departments managing the APIs. A great user experience requires also a great API developer portal. Think of a developer portal as the storefront for your API products and your API products need a great storefront, of course, in order for the adoption to be driven. And last but not least, the great API developer experience requires great developer enablement as the developers need resources and support to succeed with the consumption and the use of the APIs. And of course, you need to have accurate documentation within the developer portal. You need to have sandbox environment where someone can come and do the first hello world call. And of course, they need to feel familiar like have maybe frequently asked questions, a section there, or even forums where they can exchange information and learn more from other developers and how they're adapting the APIs. <clears throat> Before even an API program is being launched, there are several questions that need to be answered and also several thoughts that need to be made and decide in advance. The API teams think from the very beginning on how they could go faster, innovate and drive productivity. And their internal and external forces are driving these thoughts. And of course, that are somehow shaping these decisions as well. So starting with the internal forces, some questions that need to be answered are how reusability could be driven, to which extent would the API team want to control the APIs, which KPIs should be used at all? How can the APIs be designed and deployed in the best way? And on the other hand, there are external forces and some thoughts that need to be made. Um, they are around the ecosystem that someone wants to create, the organization wants to create, and how this would be created in the best way. How could you participate in the API economy? Which APIs should you expose at all as they will be needed in the market? which API products should be included in your developer portal, and much more questions. And of course, we see here a lot of hot topics like the competition, which will be my consumers, what are the expectations, what are the new journeys, new technologies I want to adapt. And of course, all this shapes your strategy and your decisions. So let us have now a look into the success metrics. <coughs> 
you see, you see here in the slide some of the critical success metrics. The initial success metric should focus on speed to API for new APIs. How frictionless is the consumption experience? How good are your APIs and the growth of your developer marketplace? More precisely, for speed to API for the new APIs, you need clear insights on how quickly your internal teams can start from an idea and publish a real API and an API product, so the collection of the APIs, within the developer portal. For the speed of API adoption, the information needed is how quickly an API consumer, the application developer, you might have heard this person also with this term in our digital value chain. So this application developer can test a new API and understand its functionality. For the API product quality, you need, of course, to know if your APIs are well designed, if they're good documented, if they're understood by the API consumers, and finally, for usage growth, you need to have insights on how quickly new developers can be onboarded and uh, discover your APIs and test and consume your APIs finally. So the success metrics, of course, change over time, based, of course, on the maturity level that your API program is evolving to. As your program matures, the metrics you measure should move to direct revenue and scaling mechanisms. We like to compare the change of the success metrics over the time with the change that the baby is going through. So babies start from crawling, they start slowly walking, and then they're running as toddlers, right? So <laughs> this is a good comparison. So more precisely now for our success metrics, at the very beginning of an API product, the success metrics are more focused towards execution, the number of APIs, the number of developers, the speed to API and the API quality are very important, and this is compared to the crawling phase of the baby. On the other hand, now, after a maturity level has been reached, and while the API program is maturing, this is why this maturity level has been reached, the walk phase is achieved, and here the success metrics focus more on the production on the product adoption. Apologies. So the important information is the number of applications consuming the APIs, the number of partners that you have onboarded, the number of customers that are using your APIs, the speed to onboarding, and of course also the NPS. Short explanation here on NPS, this stands for Net Promoter Score, which is a metric used in order to see, um, um, it measures the loyalty of customers to the given company. So how loyal do, you, do they remain in consuming your APIs? Is this a loyal customer or not? And of course, this is something very important in order to identify the needs also of these APIs and your API program in general. And finally, as the API program reaches a very high maturity level, the success metrics are focusing on the business impact and on the direct revenue that has been generated on cost reduction, on the breadth of business, on the growth of the API traffic. And of course, NPS plays here again a very important role. And important here to say that this is a continuous improvement process. So as soon as the API program starts, you don't have the same maturity level that you will achieve after a few years. So you're learning a lot from the market, you listen from your partners, you listen from your consumers, and you feed everything that you have learned back into your APIs and the API products and your strategy also in the end, right? <clears throat> so let us now have a look at the 10x transformation, which means a tremendous impact and growth and the business value. So here we see that the transformation starts from scaling projects at the very beginning into 10x projects, where the scope, the growth and the impact are much more wider, that are very big. So for 10x transformation and growth of business value, a comprehensive strategy roadmap is the key. So you see in the slide here, we have in the x-axis the ability to execute from short term to visionary, and then on the y-axis you have the business impact from scale to 10x. So you see, for example, for short-term strategies, the scale business impact, quickly, quick wins are very important. More precisely, with quick wins, easy initiatives that lay the foundation for transformation, and um, they are being achieved. So you are changing, you are transforming your API program. On the other hand, you see if the business impact should be 10x, so tremendous, very big, very important, and the ability to execute should be visionary, the strategy is heading towards transformations, meaning by that bold business vision leading to new value creation modules. 
Of course, also we had disruptions and developments respectively, but just wanted to highlight here these two parts of the strategic roadmap. <coughs> in this slide here, we see some of the core value drivers. So starting in the center of the cycle, there is a strategic vision. So in order to gain the most business value out of your API program, you will need to align with your organizations over a strategic vision and goals so that you identify directly with the direction your company is heading towards in the future. Then we have another value driver, the revenue growth, that is uh, shown in red here. Here you can explore new ways for your business to grow in your current landscape, and you can have thoughts on opportunities that could help you expand your footprint into new markets. Then we have the customer impact. This is shown in yellow here in our slide where you can have a deeper look into the experience of those who integrate with your APIs and how effectively they can consume your services. Then we have the cost savings, which is also a very important aspect and a very important value driver, which focuses on providing methods to accelerate the time to deploy, to develop, to deploy, to design, to develop, to deploy, and troubleshoot your APIs. And last but not least, there is a core to the business that helps you discover new ways of enhancing pre-existing services, powering your organizations and driving your business, of course. On the transformation journey and by having the goal for the optimum business value, one focuses on three major categories, or as we like to call them also on three big rocks. Those are having the right team, where you will need to put together a cross-organizational team to manage your API program and the API marketplace, and of course, there are several skills required for this within your team. Then you need the right governance. Here you will need to establish the right governance framework, aiming for speed optimization and leveraging automation. And finally, the right strategies, of course, also needed. Where the final aim is to create an ecosystem by designing all around an API marketplace that creates a platform for value contribution and realization. For creating now an API marketplace, you will need a team. And here you see a recommendation on how the structure could look like of this team. Of course, executive support is wanted and also needed, and it should um, help, of course, the API program to be successful. Then you have the API program, program leadership, where you could have up to three roles, the API architect, the API program lead, and the API agile lead. The one in brackets next to each role means one person per, per role. But of course, this is a suggestion and on a, based on the experience that we have and we have seen with other customers and best practice. But this might look also differently for each and every customer. Then there is the operations team or sub team, where there are roles covering the needs for operations, CI, CD and monitoring. Again, here you see a suggestion on the number of people needed for each role. And next, we have the team centered around the developer portal. And here, roles like the developer portal developer, front end developer, UX designer, technical writer, QA engineer, so quality and assurance engineer might be needed. The PT means that those roles are part time, so not full time. And this could save some resources, or some people could have more than one role. And then there is the API product team, where there are roles like the API developers, the API product owner, the API evangelist. And again, you see the suggestions on the number of persons that should be in a specific role. So all in all, we have 12 to 15 people that might be needed. But of course, this is for a basic, for a standard API program. Of course, on a bigger scale, this could be even more or even more teams needed. We will have a look also in a dedicated team roles and what is needed in a few slides. <coughs> so governance now. Governance is a very large piece of the architect's role. The goal of API governance is to manage risk while enabling speed to market. By having a set of standards already predefined, you can empower your developers to produce new digital experience even faster. Then by leveraging continuous delivery and integration, you can improve your overall testing and release continuously to meet, of course, consumer needs, API consumer needs. Of course, all the, all the collaboration with the team is the best in this way, and also collaborative documentation over a wiki is helping a lot into this direction. <coughs> For the right governance, we have also a best practice advice that each company should create their own playbook. 
And what do we mean with the playbook? The playbook describes your approach to API management as a whole. It includes essential standards that all APIs must follow for an organization, the best practices for designing APIs in a common and consumer-friendly fashion, and the essential ways of working for API producing teams to produce qualitative APIs at speed and at the scale that is requested. Your playbook should focus on six key areas. The organization, the best practices, the API design decisions, the development requirements, the API management and deployment processes, and overall having there some supportive guidelines. This should be a living document, so you could don't create it once and this is it, but you should always take care of it, have everything accurate, up to date, so that all the people within your company can have one single source of truth and reflect to it and find all the information that they would need. <clears throat> now here, when defining your right strategy, you need, of course, to fir first think, what do you want to achieve with your API program? What do you want to do? So here you see six examples of developer portals where various other customers have made thought thoughts about what they want to achieve. And they reflect this over the developer portal where they're exposing their APIs over API products. They might have also monetization plans, some of them, and they're again generating new revenue streams, they're generating their ecosystem, and they're heading towards their um, company strategy. So, for example, you see here the developer portal from TomTom. So, this company used to have some Navy devices, but of course, they completely switched their mindset and now they're exposing back -end, their backend services over APIs and they're making the profit out of it. So, they're creating an ecosystem. And every each and every of these developer portals is an ecosystem, but you need to decide to which extent. So, is it an internal ecosystem? Is it an external facing? But I will come to it within the next slide, within a minute, what an ecosystem is. <clears throat> so, what is a digital ecosystem? <laughs> digital business ecosystems encompass a network of partners, developers, and customers facilitated by modern cloud-first technologies. They can be made up entirely of internal parties, such as developers within an organization, or can expand to include external organizations and individuals, such as suppliers, third-party providers, customers, developers, partners, regulators, in some cases also even competitors. Why not? And now let us have a look at why digital ecosystems matter. Let's say you are really ready and happy to start the journey of building your ecosystem. The first question you might need to answer or even justify internally in your company is why should you build up an ecosystem, a digital ecosystem? Is it maybe because it's a trend nowadays and it's heard a lot nowadays? The truth is that ecosystems have the power to help you connect on a much deeper level with your customers. The more a company knows about its customers, the better able it is to react to their needs and to offer a truly integrated end-to-end -end digital experience. And the company will be able to connect more services in its ecosystem to those customers, learning even more in the process. In this way, the customer needs will be better met and new consumers will be discovered. Now let's ask again, so why is it important to have an ecosystem? And the answer is in order to grow your business. And for this, defining the strategy on the kind of ecosystem that needs to be built is important. So do you want to go for a public ecosystem? Do you want to go for an industry, for a partner or an internal? This is a decision that will help you grow your business and define your strategy. Good. Now let us have a look at the API governance best practices. So governance, when applied to the API first model, is a balancing act. We need to manage risk while enabling speed and agility to meet the consumer needs. We don't want heavyweight authority, control and regulation. This is the old world of, of governance. We will have a comparison slide in a minute. And organizations have a hierarchy. What tends to happen is that we push information to authority. The people at the bottom, so at this triangle here, imagine that there are people at the bottom here, the normal developers that are doing their everyday job. They have all the information needed, but the, they don't have the authority to make decisions and force these decisions. This results in bottlenecks and delays. We create systems that channel the information up, a decision is taken, and then it comes back down again. That tends to make some time and then people with this information get to execute. An alternative is pushing authority to the information. 
The foundation for this model is making sure that the people that are closest to the information are both technically competent and have organizational clarity. They understand the priorities and know what the right um, thing is to do. And they are empowered to make the decisions and are happy with this by making these accurate decisions. So how do we apply it now API governance? If a centralized team has all the authority, then we can't scale and be agile uh, as we want to. We must give developers, whether they're publishing or consuming APIs, the information and knowledge they need to publish and use these APIs. And on the other hand, we should aim for automation, not leave everything to, up to someone. And uh, so everyone will create their own uh, solutions, but enforce automation, enforce company-wide standards, enforce controls in order to be sure that everything is up to date. And if in this way, we are promoting the adoption and the growth of the whole API program. <clears throat> Good. The goal is to move from a center of excellence into a center of enablement. And you see here where we have dedicated solutions in the center of excellence and in a center of enablement, we have a holistic view on everything where everything is connected, is in a specific spot that makes sense. Now, this is the slide promised before with the a capital G and the lowercase g. So if your organization is truly um, on their transformation journey, on the digital transformation journey, it is much deeper the decisions they need to take than, than exposing some APIs or creating just a developer portal. So think about why your company started this initiative. If the benefits include reducing costs and accelerating time to market, then the initiative has to go beyond building just APIs and creating API products. To achieve those aims, imposing a heavy weight process that encourages blind compliance is not the case. So this was a traditional governance model where everything was being enforced, rules were enforced, everything was in, heading in one direction, there were strict permissions, you could not take decisions, documentation was not sh shared with everyone over a week, but it was more in Microsoft documents, in um, Word documents, and um, some were um, saved on a drive. You had the teams not collaborating with each other, but being more siloed mode but this is not the right way how this sh all should be approached. So you see on the other hand, governance with a lowercase g, where the decision is being given to the teams themselves. So you foster their collaboration, you foster their, an environment of exchange where everyone has an opinion, where you have cross-functional teams, where of course you have standards that needs to be empowered, but the um, releases are continuously, you have a standard process and not only one person is taking the decision. So um, I want to think or we think more in APG about this governance with lowercase as a freeway. So um, this is that you have your own specific freeway, the direction is set, but you can change it at any time through the junctions Guardrails, the dividers help keep cars on the right side. The lanes are painted to suggest the right way, but of course you can drive cross of them or change lanes. And the emphasis is on keeping the flow. Imagine now if big G governance was in control every time you needed to accelerate, slow change lines, or even change the direction. This would be really uh, unproductive. This wouldn't help at all. What would do that to traffic? So little g provides the standards, the principles, the best practices. Teams are trusted and empowered through tooling and automation. Information and documentation is shared collaboratively and teams are cross-functional to minimize handoffs and communication issues. And this all forces the adoption and forces the growth of the API program. <coughs> When talking about governance, also three modes uh, and sometimes needed. So some of them, like the policeman, is not the one that is expected, but of course, all modes of them are needed and sometimes also requested. So starting with the policeman, first, there is this mode that is writing standards, fighting battles, making sure that the API consumer experience is met and making sure that the core features that are needed are delivered. Then we have the referee mode. This might be needed. So whenever the, we need to balance needs, we need to balance opinions and maintain also the impartiality in time. And as the API program matures, this is more and more handled by everyone himself. So this is something that you will see that will not be really needed. 
And last but not least, there is also the teacher mode. And the teacher mode um, promotes learning, uh, promotes all the expertise, sharing everything, enabling also other teams, sharing the best practices, like making sure that everyone is up to date within the teams, within the company, and all the information is widely shared and communicated. So now, what is an API product? Probably you have heard it a lot also from our colleagues, so <laughs> bear with us uh, if we are um, saying it for another time again and again. So traditionally, an API product was a good or a service that meets the needs of a specific audience, of a consumer audience, and creates enough profit in order to be existent on the market. The API product is a modern concept for machine-to-machine -machine communication, for machine-to-machine -machine interaction. And in the RPG world, an API product is a logical grouping of APIs, of one or more APIs, a collection of APIs into an API product with a specific consumer audience in mind. And this API product is the one that is also being published in the developer portal where it can be discovered uh, by the consumer, the consumers, the target audiences, and they can try it out and consume it straight away, consume the APIs. <laughs> Within APG now, we promote, of course, an API product mindset. An API product mindset aims to design and deliver as for long-term value at scale and involving them over time to meet the changing customer needs. Designing and delivering APIs and API product is a continuous process and not a one-time thing. You listen to the market, to your consumer needs, and you're adjusting your API products whenever needed to meet those needs. So this is a continuous improvement process. This is a living strategy of how your API products should look like. Also, when designing your APIs and your API products, you should have in mind to do it in the best and the easiest way. So always think about your API consumers and how they would have their life easier by discovering the APIs and trying them out. So no one wants uh, non-accurate documentation. No one wants to go through two, three pages in order to understand. So keep it simple, keep it easy so that, that, so that the APIs and the API product strategy can be consumed easily and uh, consumers will adapt to them very quickly. Okay. It just maybe a general note, this <clears throat> this governance is uh, it, it's not baked into the product, right? We, uh, we are supporting with our product these processes, but it's all up to your organization and how you want to make it work, like the three modes, policeman, referee, and teacher. It is really what fits your culture, but also what fits the purpose of the API program within your organization. So we're giving best practices. We're giving guardrails here that you can uh, you can drive your own car. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kevin. Yes, very important here to say. So this is up to the company. And of course, a startup company might have a completely different view on the things compared to an enterprise company, right? So. This is up to you. We're just giving some best practices, some hints, but you will decide in the end what works for you and what would be the best thing for you to do. Here in this slide, you see a full overview of all the processes that are in scope for API governance. So you see the six core categories that are engagement, platform operations, developer portal, API consumers and API providers. So if I have a look at the developer portal, you see that some um, processes, some topics or topics that are being addressed are the feature prioritization. So what should be first included in the developer portal? What should follow next? What should be there? Do I want to monetize my APIs? Shall I go for monetization from the very first step? What should I do? How should my feature release look like every two months, every six months? So how do I want to proceed? How will the sprint development look like? So when can I deliver more functionalities? What is about my API product strategy, about publishing my API products, and how will I notify developers? Uh, what do I want to do if there are any changes in the API product, um, and so on. So all these topics are very important and are falling under the API governance. In the same way, under engagement, for example, what is my platform vision? What do I want to achieve? What will be my value proposition? Which external partnerships do I want to establish? Do I want to establish external partnerships at all? Do I want to have external users consuming my APIs? How should my ecosystem look like? What will be my strategy? What will be my roadmap? 
uh, how can uh, others discover my APIs? Where should they find my APIs? Do I want the self-service over the developer portal, so which is the common case, or do I want to run through approval workflows so that I have fully control who consumes my APIs at every minute? So all of these are um, decisions. And also, I want all the visibility, all the monitoring, uh, all the KPIs in order to understand how my API program is performing. So all of this are very important information that one needs to take into consideration for API governance. Of course, it might be that all, not all um, core categories are very important, the same from the very beginning. So again, a company here decides what makes more sense at the given moment, prioritizes this, and then focuses also in the other areas, if it should be the scope to focus also in the other areas. But of course, this is now here the best practice, and you see everything um, <laughs> rounded up. And very important here to say under operations, we have patching APG. So this is more not for the SaaS option, of course. So when you're using also pay as you go in the SaaS option, you, we are handling everything, upgrades, patching for you. But of course, for other versions, like our on-premise version of APG, where APG can be installed 100% on, on premises or in another cloud of your choice on VMs then of course also patching and upgrades are being handled just to highlight this not to have any confusion here that you will need to do anything in this direction we are handling everything from you so on the platform itself then for operating the platform we have the shared flow so if i want to enforce some given policies each and every time so a shared flow is a collection of policies that are being deployed once and they can be used again and again do I want to have a CICD pipeline? So um, Christoph will talk to us <laughs> through this in uh, a few minutes. Will I go for revisions? Well, how should my versioning strategy look like? So all of these are decisions that need to be taken and can be taken. I will not go deeper into this direction for the sake of time, but you get the general impression about all the topics that need to be taken into consideration. Now let us have a look at the API team and as the name says, this team builds and manages the APIs and this is the team that will be working straight away with the APG platform, with the API platform to create the APIs. And they need a wider skill set so to cover all the given needs and this is why we have here four roles, you see the API team lead or leader, then we have the API architect or developer the evangelist and the extended team. And you will see with some bullet points what each and everyone is doing to, um, in this specific given role. The API team leader interacts with multiple levels within the organization. They're essentially the product owner if we are in this traditional Scrum model. As such, they should have a product owner mentality and be able to make also very tough decisions and calls, turn down, <laughs> um, some opinions if this is needed, if this is not going into the right direction. The API team leader should also have a strong relationship with the business team. Linking this back to the product owner mentality, the API team leader should understand the business vision, the priorities, and have the context required to understand the big picture in order to create stronger user stories and accurate user stories for the team and also prioritize the backlog and what should be delivered in a given time. The API team leader will need to know the capabilities of the API platform so they can quickly assess the business use case and determine how to successfully deliver the APIs. And the API team lead should also be able to articulate high-level requirements and translate them into core technical details. So this will be needed by the developers in order to implement the user stories and uh, perform the tasks as needed. And last but not least, of course, they need good communication and listening skills as they will need to interact with many persons within the given company. Now let's have a look at the API architects and developers. These people will be your technical counterparts. These are really the techies that are on the platform and need to have a very deep technical understanding and know-how um, of um, the platform because the architects and developers will be translating the business value into technical assets, they should be very skilled, know all about the company, know all about the best practices for API design and implementation, understand also all internal processes, and of course have a wider technical understanding in terms of what is XML, JSON, what are REST APIs, what are SOAP APIs, what are HTTP verbs, and so on, in order to be able to manage all the aspects.
The architect and the API developer should also have, have the um, depth knowledge of the API platform. So what are the capabilities, what would be needed in order to extend them and be able also to write some custom codes if this is needed. If one of the out of the box policy is not uh, suiting the needs, then we have extens um, extensibility policies, Java, JavaScript, Python. So those are the persons that we need to bring in the skills if this is needed and requested. Of course, I need to know uh, how a CICD pipeline works, how the delivery process should look like, how the release process should look like, how the versioning should look like. All these are aspects of their job. And of course, they need, again, here good communication and listening skills as we want to ha have cross-function teams that are interacting and working together with each other. This is a core um, prerequisite in order to have a good and accurate collaboration. Then we have the API evangelists that plays a unique role since they are focused on promoting the APIs and the um, application developer community. And because of this, the evangelists should be passionate about the APIs in order to be able also to excite others within the company and outside about these APIs. So they need to be enthusiastic, otherwise they will not be in the right position in order to do this. Second, they must have a deep understanding on what the API consumer needs are and how these API consumers could be successful by consuming the APIs. Having this insight will allow them to communicate the feedback back to the rest of the API team and to ensure the needs of the consumers are being met. Then the APG, um, they need to understand the APG developer portal, so um, the storefront, and understand also um, all the needs and communicate this and make sure also that the right APIs are reflected, that the right audiences are on the developer portal, that they can find themselves familiar within the developer portal, that everything is accurate. <coughs> They should also understand the onboarding process on the developer portal and know which developers, which applications are consuming APIs and if this is covering all their needs or if something is needed also on the top. And as you have seen also in the previous other two roles, also the good communication and listening skills are again here needed as in every aspect of the roles. And last but not least, we have extended team that covers also multiple groups. So you can think here of separate groups, also one big group with subgroups here, with sub teams here. So for example, we consider in this extended team, teams like the security team, the quality and assurance team, and uh, of course, other teams based on the needs of your company. And because of these multiple groups that are within this big extended team, also different functional areas will be needed. So, of course, there might be some technical skill sets needed. So, for security, for example, be familiar with the standard security mechanisms with what um, the company sees as the um, standard security mechanisms that need to be always enforced, what is hot in the market, what is needed, what is being requested. For operations, for example, understand various pros, uh, pro, um, aspects like TLS, MTLS, what are the firewall rules, and uh, what could I do, networking teams, for example. So all based on the given team that they are being assigned to, they need to have all this technical background that their role requests. And again, here, as we are talking about a cross-functional team, that extended team with multiple sub-teams inside, again, the good communication skills and the listening skills are requested so that there is a good collaboration assured. Good. Now, the API teams are, of course, um, responsible for building the APIs, making sure that uh, the APIs are being built with the business value in mind, that they're being um, updated whenever needed, um, reflecting all the needs of the market. Second is learning and applying all the best practices to the APIs that they will be building. They promote a variety of industry best practices when it comes to design development um, and deployment and publishing of the APIs. Third is engagement, so similar to our focus on the APIs, the API team should be engaged with all players in the digital value chain. I assume you have seen this slide before by my colleagues. And this includes also the backend system teams, which have the backend services that we are fronting, that we are proxying. 
So com good communication with all these teams, understanding all components and personas of the digital value chain is very valuable here. Then scalability is very important when it comes to the API program. So oftentimes we see API teams start small but grow rapidly as more and more demand comes down to the pipeline. And in this scenario, federation becomes very important. And the API team owns the creation and management of materials that allow the entire organization to rapidly scale. And this includes also the API playbook that we have seen before, automated test suits, and much more. And finally, API should always be improving. So by leveraging capabilities of the platform, such as analytics, the API team can gain valuable insights into who is consuming my APIs. Am I meeting all the needs that my consumers have? Do I need to add something on top? And this information allows the API team to find all the areas of improvement and enhances also the API adoption and the API uh, program maturing step by step. So successful API teams have strong executive sponsor support. They have a mandate to build APIs, the willingness to train others to onboard new persons, to educate them. They have direct access to the um, lines of business whenever needed, and they are free from pre-existing constraints. As we manage, as we have mentioned before, the API team should strive for innovation and not be constrained by outdated governance models or processes. So change should be embraced. It should be seen as something completely good rather than trying to push something into, into an inefficient process that will not work and things will break and things will not work the way that they are intended. So in our world, change is something very good and we should adapt to change as we are listening to the market, as we are listening to the needs, as we want to improve also ourselves. Let's now have a look at the operating model of an API platform or of an API program and how it could look like and evolve, evolve in time. So um, you will see now, this is a slide here with one click, you will see each and every phase. So of course, each and every company, when they're adapting a new API strategy, when they're adapting a new API platform, they start small. So we have, first of all, the engage phase, where you can have a few persons, you will have the API program leadership, which we have seen, there might be also operations needed. After a given time, and when you know the direction you're heading to, that you want to build an ecosystem, that you want to spin up a developer portal, when you know which APIs you want to expose, then you, we are in the excite phase where you are starting your API program, you need your API team, you need, of course, again here, the API program leadership and operations in order to start um, flying with your API program. After that, you will go into the expand phase. So you have already um, exposed some APIs. You have seen the market. You know more and more APIs. Um, you have identified more and more APIs and use cases that you would like um, to extend your API program to. And here you see that you have also the developer portal where everything is fronted. And of course, here you have the need of more persons as you're covering more needs of the market. So in general, here you could have 10 to 20 full-time employees. So, and also include some lines of business and also front more API products. After this phase, we have the evangelized phase where you have reached a very good maturity level. You know exactly what the market needs. You know exactly what you want to offer and where you extend also your API team more as you need more and more developers in order to be able to keep up with all the uh, continuous requests in order to expose more and more backend services and front them over APIs. <clears throat> Here you see a suggestion how an API team, also how the API center of enablement could look like in terms of headcount, how many people would be needed per each role. Again, here this is a suggestion, this is something based on best practices and what we have seen, and um, this is based on our studies that we have made. But of course, it's not a one size fits all. This looks differently for each and every customer and based on the demands each and every one has. So, and now let's go into the last part, centralized or federated governance, <laughs> what would be the best? 
So when an organization starts or has had an uncoordinated program, it is operating in a federated manner. Speed is high, supporting rapid innovation. However, reuse, visibility across organization and consistency are very low. While this is a good place to be in when you're innovating, it can create considerable technical debt if left for too long. If standards do not rapidly evolve and transition into automated mechanisms of enforcement, problems will be generated for the long term. Either when organizations grow an API program for a single team or in response to a lack of alignment in a federated model, development can be centralized with the APIs <clears throat> being defined and prioritized within other teams. The centralized model here provides strong alignment with standards and can provide a consistent API look and feel to API consumers. Visibility of APIs is high and reuse can be heavily promoted. However, the team can rapidly become a bottleneck and if the development team is not sufficient, sufficiently scaled, prioritization occurs across product owners leading to resource constraints and even conflicts. Even if the team is large, cost allocation can be difficult and bottlenecks still occur. So balancing now the federation and centralization, the hybrid model sees the API program define and promote standards, API first, CI-CD pipelines, checks, best practices, and demonstrate this with core APIs that are not naturally aligned to one part of the organization. Other API development is federated to those closest to the demand. This gives the best of both worlds while avoiding the drawbacks and allows organization to scale. However, the pace of change will not be as fast as federated model and strong KPIs and automation are of course required to give federated teams the ability to innovate while retaining an overview of the API program. You see the API program maturity assessment and this is based on the answers that a company can provide in a specific scoring section and the maturity level that is reached. So you have on the one hand the organization that has engagement, funding, federation and roadmap then you have execution, standard CI-CD automation, publish onboarding, consumer onboarding, and then you have metrics with KPIs and speed with new APIs. So all of these sections can be answered or you can find exactly where you um, are at a given moment. And based on your answers, then you're reaching a given maturity uh, score and you are on a specific maturity level. So the maturity level starts from starting early, mid and mature. And of course, mature is the highest level that can be reached. The colors there, the blue, the red, doesn't have to mean anything that red is bad. It's just the colors that we used here um, in order for this scoring framework. So summarizing a few core bullet points, the target operating models follow a pattern as they evolve. So API team growth should be expected when you're starting very small with one, two, three persons. It can easily... Uh, go up to 30 people or even more, depending on the scale of your API program and the needs of your company. Then you have, um, we have the centralized federated models that still need, require some roles within a center of enablement. And this is why you should, from the very beginning, make your thoughts about your roles, make your thoughts about persons that would really fit in the given role and um, plan in advance with having in mind that your pro um, API uh, program will, might scale in time and be aware of all the changes that might occur and how you could face them. Thank you, Maya, for your... I think it, it was not easy with your, with your voice, but you, you, are, you are able to go until the, until the end of your presentation. Uh, congrats. Yeah. Apologies, <laughs> team, as you might know, I have a cold, so as you have understood, so <laughs> thank no, God my voice didn't leave me. You <laughs> did it perfectly, so thank you, Maya. Yeah, so I will be a little bit more in um, in, in in the from in the technique, in fact, in the in the yeah the the technology of uh, and the concept of, of CI/CD, and then the the, the goal is to um, is to present, in fact, how you can automate things to uh, to manage your proxy in uh, in APG and also to apply some rules uh, because we are talking also about uh, governance and to standardize or to uh, reinforce rules uh, during your, your pipeline. So this is a, a global topic. There is a lot of slides. Sometimes I will go 
fast or too fast to, uh, to, to slide, but you will see that I want to uh, make this presentation very useful for you. So the list of the tools is maybe is not so much interesting to present tools one by one, but at the end, you will have the list and you can reuse or implement this tool or this other one. So it can be, I hope, uh, useful for, for you. And again, feel free to interrupt also if, uh, if needed. So how I can develop with, with APGs? The, the first thing, and maybe the, the easiest thing to do is to use the web UI. Using UI, you can have a very easy to use interface. <clears throat> you can do some drag and drop. Um, you can create flow with drag and drop using out of the box policy and then just have to configure the uh, attribute of, um, of policy. So it's very easy to create a proxy. You have access to online documentation. You have also access to the trace tool. So um, it's something that it's very easy to use um, almost when we, when we start, in fact, to, to use APG. The problem with this kind of UI, it's we have no trust of what you do. Of course, we have an audit log to be able to, to know who um, changed this proxy, uh, at what time it was done, et cetera. But what is the difference between two releases, for example? We have access on the two releases of the same proxy, but I, can, I cannot do a diff between the two releases. Um, if I want to do a rollback, of course I can do it, but I have to, again, to, to do it manually. So this is not a way to work uh, as a global team working on the uh, centralized platform. And for that, we have, of course, to automate and to use more uh, DevOps approach with the CI CD pipeline to have to be able to answer, in fact, all these questions we could have in part of the deployment of your, of your proxy. If we consider also the personas and goal of these different persona in, in the CI CD approach, of course, we have the developers. And the role of the developers, of the development team, is to be able to deploy and iterate on the application in an agile mode and more and more uh, fast. That means we have to be able to produce, uh, update, uh, evolution on application, evolution on, on API, more and more um, in a more and more agile uh, way. That means maybe every day, I want to push a little modification, but I want to be able to do it in, a, in every day, not to wait at the end of the, of the month to do it. So developer um, can take a, a real advantage of, use, uh, um, of using a, a CI CD pipeline. The operation also, it's, a, it's another persona with a lot of interest uh, in, the, in the pipeline also, because this is a way to, um, to have a look of what is deployed, how it is deployed, and maybe to reinforce some standardization in terms of security, in terms of uh, name, for example, of proxy, why not? And in terms of policy that will be embedded in the, into the, the proxy. <clears throat> so uh, we, what we want to guarantee to operation team is developer can do more and more things, but always in the good way although it was uh, defined at the enterprise level. And of course now, today we cannot speak about API without speaking about uh, security. And then again, I, I can be sure that what is deployed is secure. I want to have a guarantee on that to be sure that all the policies that have to be deployed in terms of threat protection, maybe authentication, authorization, are uh, well deployed in my in my CI/CD. So the security team uh, have also a lot of interest into the into the CI/CD pipeline. I don't want to do um, um, I don't know um, a CI/CD uh, course, of course, on the what is the concept of CI/CD of the of the the, um, the topics we could have around the CI/CD, but just to reinforce uh, three pillars, in fact, on, the, on, the, on this foundation. The first thing is, what is the role of the configuration management? Why continuous integration? And why continuous testing? This is the, the three part, and I will be uh, very fast on these topics. It's not uh, something that it's uh, related only to APG. APG 
is part on this uh, CI/CD and DevOps, DevOps, uh, DevOps approach. So we see standard, standard, but we have to keep in mind. So the first thing about configuration management is reproducibility and traceability. I want to be able to redeploy all my environment the same way I did it before. I want to reproduce what I did in test, maybe to reproduce it in uh, Q&A, to reproduce it in pre-prod, and maybe after that in prod, exactly the same way. And of course, if you do it manually, we cannot be sure that you, you will do exactly the same uh, environment after environment. So this is the first thing, the first goal that we want to achieve. Doing exactly the same every time I, I want to redeploy, deploy or redeploy my environment. And the second thing, it's traceability and maybe maybe auditability also. That means I want to be sure that of what I did yesterday. If there is an issue in production, I want to understand what happened between the version that works well and the new version that have a bug, for example. So I want to understand who deployed, what was deployed, and I have access to the to the maybe the the previous version of the, the, the proxy and the new version of the proxy to be able to compare both. And this is something that is very important. And you will see in the CI-CD, the fact that we can store artifact to have this traceability, to be able to have to give this vision of what I did yesterday is something that is very important. From a configuration management benefit, of course, we can use uh, all this um, of what I said on different use cases, and for example, the, the fact that we can reproduce, recreate an environment from a white page in a disaster recovery story. This is something that is very important, of course. The higher quality, also the fact that we will not have any more manual uh, action on the interface, but everything is written in code in the pipeline, so we can test one, two, three to be sure that the next time I will use it, it will be perfect. And it will be always perfect because I will reuse the same deployment code. And of course, same for capacity management or respond to defect, to be able to, to roll back to the previous version. This is this kind of benefits we will, we will have this, uh, with, um, with the configuration management. From uh, a continuous integration point of view, the goal is to be able to deploy more often a small update. That means before waiting a, a month to push a huge update and uh, to change everything on, the, on the, what is running in production, I want to be able to deploy small update every day if needed. That means not to wait some, some time to, to be able to deploy. And for that, of course, I need a code repository as a, a true uh, source of um, of my of my code, and keep in mind that uh, an APG proxy is a, it's like a source code. We will manage it like a source code. It's exactly the same with automation, with self testing. Do not automating something without testing what automatically what you are uh, deploying. This is something that is key. I will talk about that just after. But uh, no automation without uh, without testing. This is the the, the, the sentence we have to, to keep in mind. So to be able to push as, uh, as soon as, as often I want my, my, my update in a standard way, in an automated way, this is something that is very important for developers and also the standardization part is for the, uh, the operation. The benefit, less bug, uh, more reactive, more agile in terms of development to be able to produce maybe some um, some updates, some um, to 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 react to response to the business need more faster when they need something. So this is all this kind of benefit we will have with continuous integration for code, of course, for application code, but also for for APG. There is nothing special, I would say, for for APG. Last part of uh, last pillar, I would say, of CI/CD, it's the continuous testing. We could test a lot of things. We could do some different kind of tests. We try to uh, figure out in this slide of the category of tests we could have and how we can test. In fact, from 
um, we can do it automatically or manually sometimes and if you want to uh, to test maybe some usability of your new web ui of course uh, the usability uh, it, it may be not automated maybe yes maybe not but maybe we you want to have a feedback from the end user that it's beautiful it's very easy to use uh, this button it's too small this kind of thing that maybe you will need a manual testing but for api of course we can automate all the tests we want it can be some functional and accepted acceptance test and we will see that with um, with the integration test or bdd behavior driven development test it can be also some unit test more technical more on the technology phase of, of the of the test itself it can be a um, functional unit test or maybe non-functional uh, unit test like performance testing why not if we want to be sure that we deploy uh, a proxy an apg proxy in production and of course beyond this proxy there is also back end and we want to be sure that we can achieve i don't know 300 tps uh, with this uh, flow in fact proxy plus a backend then at the end of the deployment we can run this kind of performance testing or load testing if we if we need so different kind of test i will try to illustrate in my demonstration all these kind of tests we could have like that we can uh, you can build your, your pipeline as you as you want another thing that is very important it's apg uh, does not impose a pipeline that means what are the pipeline you will use to automatically deploy an apg configuration or an apg proxy the one you want the one you want sorry that means if you already use jenkins you could still use jenkins if you have if you are using circle ci you could still use circle ci same for github same for azure same for gitlab as you want that means we does we, we we don't want to impose a way to automate in fact your ip deployment uh, and as the opposite we want to be sure that we could uh, use the the pipeline you already are uh, you're already using during the um, deployment you will we, you will have to do some tests some tasks and of course every time we will have some tools that can be used to uh, maybe to edit uh, the proxy not in the ui but in your in your ide so you will need an a development environment and, uh, and here maybe not maybe you will need also um, a source code manager to be able to store in um, uh, your, your code all the test tools and we will see that just after that you will need for static code analysis for coverage uh, testing all these kind of tools um, can be used during these uh, steps of the deployment a way to deploy uh, of course your proxy and to talk to apg to create some configuration or to deploy uh, a new proxy to test what was deployed to publish artifact to be able to prove what I what I did during my deployment, and maybe also we can think about updating a documentation in a developer portal or maybe uh, elsewhere, where with the, the documentation, like that we can have a, a documentation up to date um, for this new proxy that uh, or this new API that was deployed. So now we are going to see all these kind of tools this tool can be tools provided by specific editor uh, we can recognize postman for example here it can be some open source uh, tools and we can see uh, gsint for example here and also i will present the tools provided by apg to be able to build this kind of, uh, of pipeline something also that you have to to keep in mind is that apg provide an apg api that means all the things you are able to do using the web ui you can do it using an api of course it's a low level interface to talk with the management place we have to use curl for example or, uh, or to create your own program your own application 
to embed this API to create um, uh, a way to talk with the management plane. But you could always automate everything with APG because you have all the APG API needed for, for that. The tools I will present um, are not, in fact, this API, this low-level interface. It's more something that it's developer-oriented or CICD-oriented. But keep in mind that you can do everything with APG API. Deploy a proxy, create an application, get analytics, get alerting from uh, on, on, on monitoring information. You can do everything with this kind of API. So this is something that can reassure you if you want to be sure that you can automate something in, in, a, in APG. First, what does it mean to, um, to deploy? Um, what can I deploy, in fact, into APG to have something that can be run into APG? In APG, we are talking about proxy and shared flow to be able to, uh, to share some policy uh, between, between proxy. But this is only one part of a, a running environment inside APG. This a proxy maybe needs some caching or KVM or target server. That means some variable that you want to manage at the environment level. That means it's not code, it's more a configuration, it's a key value information sometimes that you will have also to deploy because this proxy needs, for example, this KVM. We have also uh, on APG, we, we talk about the API product and we know that the product is a bundle of API proxy. So maybe after deploying two proxy, I will have to create one product to be able to uh, promote this, to publish this product into a, a developer portal, for example. And for that, of course, we can do it also in, um, in, in the pipeline. We can create an app uh, that subscribe to this product and we can create a developer that create an app that subscribe to this product. That means all this line, all this object can be automatically created into APG. Maybe you will deploy only KVM and proxy, for example, and product and application will be deployed in another pipeline, or maybe product in another pipeline and application, it will be done by the application developer using a developer portal, but you can do it from end to end if you want using the same tool. That means uh, the API management, CLI, or something like a Maven, uh, Maven tool, for example. So we have a specific tool for to be able to deploy the proxy, and we have quite the same tool to be able to deploy the rest of the configuration, KVM, uh, product, application, and developer. So let's have a look on this um, on this tool now. I will go back on this slide just uh, just after. The the first thing it's Maven to be able to deploy a proxy. We uh, we propose to use Maven. You know Maven. It's a standard um, tool in the more in the Java developer environment, but it can be used also to to deploy not only Java but uh, also some other things like, like uh, APG proxy. And for that, we um, APG uh, propose specific Maven plugin to manage configuration, KVM, um, application, product, uh, target server, all this kind of uh, configuration object, and also to be able to uh, deploy the proxy itself. So we have two plugins. Um, you can use one or the other, depending of, of what you, you want to do. And for that, we will provide a configuration file to deploy configuration or to deploy the proxy itself. So Maven is a way to deploy proxy. Sometime I was asked if we provide some Terraform um, uh, module to deploy proxy. This is not our approach. Terraform, it's more infrastructure as code and not configuration as code or program as code, uh, I would say. So we provide some Terraform module, but to be able to deploy APG infrastructure, not to deploy APG configuration. So for that, we are more uh, on the developer um, environment, 
in developer uh, domain and for that we provide developer tool like mm, like a plugin uh, maven plugin for example if you search uh, on um, on google of course you could find some people that are developed terraform module to deploy apg proxy it runs of course terraform can do that but it, it's not supported by google it is not provided by google but if you want with all the the warning i can um, i can i can push you can use this kind of uh, of terraform module but this is not a, a google um, managed project to be able to to provide this terraform module to um, to deploy uh, apg proxy We have also some CLI to be able to deploy in an easy way to deploy a, a proxy or a configuration. We provide currently two, uh, two CLI. The first one is SAC Mesa, uh, and you have the link every time for the, for the, for, for the tool. Uh, SAC Mesa, it's, a, it's more developer oriented CLI that allow you to, if you are not very familiar, familiar with Maven, for example, SAC Messer can do it for you. That means you can say SAC Messer deploy something, and then automatically this, this uh, CLI will use Maven to deploy your proxy in the in the Maven way. So it's something that it's very, very easy to, to use in the CLI uh, way. You can also use it in a script, in shell scripts, for example. And it's more about deployment. So typically what we want to achieve with them. Um, with a with a pipe uh, CLI um, with a pipeline, sorry. So this is one way to to use uh, a CLI. We have another one, APG CLI. It's more, I would say, it's developer, but more administrator oriented. That means you can also retrieve some analytics, do this kind of thing. You can deploy proxy, of course, but you can do more. So it's more a full administrative capability CLI, and maybe less developer oriented and also from an um, uh, admin uh, point of view we are now working to incorporate apg into the standard g cloud cli google cloud cli so you can already use it you cannot do everything with this uh, g cloud command at the moment but you can see that you can start to do something like deploy a proxy view a deployment so i don't know to be to be honest i don't know but i think we will use more and more of this g cloud cli because this is the standard of google cloud so ipg will be more um, incorporated in this uh, in this uh, um, standard cli the api of course we have documentation to have the list of all the api and at the end a sum up of what you can do with different CLI for different uh, different kind of, uh, of use case. If you want to work on your own laptop, you can develop on your own, own laptop. So you can use the web UI and to start using APG is the easier. But after that, maybe you will use always the same canvas, the same template of proxy, and it will be easier for you to use your own IDE to work on your laptop to uh, to modify and to create a new one starting from this template and for that we provide some um, interface some plugin to work with IDE and we are more VS Code oriented again so VS Code if it's a very powerful IDE and you can uh, for example install some Git Maven uh, G Cloud maybe plugin into this uh, this IDE. And we also provide some APG tool as a VS Code plugin. The one that you can see on the video, it's a, a snippet generator. If you want to create um, a policy uh, uh, into your uh, um, proxy flow, then you can uh, enter API dash and you will see all the policy available and you just have to select the one you want and configure it the same way you are working on the web UI, but this is inside um, inside uh, VS Code. We also provide a full local development environment, and you have the reference to the documentation. That means that you can develop your proxy in VS Code 
and run your proxy also in VS Code. You don't have to deploy it in the um, instance of APG in the cloud, but you can test it. So it's, it can be very useful for a developer to create a proxy, test, make a lot of tests, maybe technical step, uh, steps, um, maybe discover some new policy, try some new policy. And at the end, I want to push it in the dev environment because I want to share it with all the other developers. But first, I want to work locally on my side. And then for that, you can um, create, uh, in, uh, implement into uh, your VS Code environment a full APG uh, proxy and also gateway. You have a gateway running as a the Docker container that can be used from VS Code to deploy your proxy and to call your proxy on localhost running really on your on your on laptop. Now, if you if we consider the test, this is something that is very critical. APG provide a APG proxy linter, a way to validate the quality of the code of your proxy to be sure that your proxy respect some best practice rules or maybe some enterprise rule in terms of development. I'm really talking about the code of the proxy, APG proxy itself. So for that, you have APG Lint. This is a, an open source tool that you can, uh, you can use for, for free. And then this tool will generate this kind of report saying that, OK, I, um, I test all your proxy and I have there is two warnings based on the fact that you don't respect the name uh, rules, the naming rules, for example, of this kind of thing. And something that is very interesting say, it's that you can create your own rules. That means if from an enterprise point of view, you want to impose that uh, every proxy should have a spike arrest policy, I want to be sure before the deployment that my proxy embed this, um, this spike arrest policy, then you can create a new rule in IPG Lint checking that this policy is there before the deployment. If you want to impose a, name, uh, a naming convention, you can do it. And you can do whatever you want, in fact, because it's a simple um, plugin uh, architecture for this tool based on the JavaScript. So you can have easily some, uh, some, new, uh, some new rules you would like to, um, to test before the deployment. And more than this, now we are also providing APG Lint for VS Code. That means if you develop your proxy inside VS Code, then in the interactive way, it's just um, a menu here, you can test that what, has, uh, what I'm, uh, I do is, is currently correct. Before trying to deploy, I can validate that my proxy respect the enterprise rule, maybe, to be sure that it's uh, it's good from a, a proxy point of view. My proxy uh, respect the best practice, respect the enterprise rules. Then I could try to deploy it just after. I don't know if you know, but APG allows you also to create your own policy based on standard language like JavaScript, Python, or Java. That means that in my proxy, I could have some Java code, Python code, or JavaScript code. So I want, I have to also validate, test and validate this kind of JavaScript, for example, code. So as an example, I put two, um, two tools to test your JavaScript. ESLint, this is um, a linter for JavaScript. So you could have in your proxy maybe a JavaScript policy and you can validate the quality of this JavaScript code using this kind of linter. And you want maybe also to run some unit tests on this JavaScript policy, uh, APG JavaScript policy. And for that, we have there is also some open uh, open source uh, tool. Uh, ESLint is also an open, uh, an open source tool. And you have an open, open source tool, sorry, able to validate and test, test your JavaScript like, for example, Mocha, that can be used to, uh, for, for JavaScript. And you could have the same for Python and maybe the same for, um, for Java if you want to deploy some Java code or some Python code. 
at the end of the deployment, what is very important is also to be sure that it was deployed and it runs as expected, I would say. And for that, we propose a tool, Apicly, that it's an integration test, end-to-end -end integration test. Or we call my APIG proxy that will call the backend that will send the response back to the customer, to the application, uh, the client application, and then it runs as expected. So Apicly is based on the Cucumber framework, an open source uh, framework. And so Apicly provide a BDD way, behavior driven development way to test your API. That means that you can write some functional test in a human language or not really human, but um, not so technical language to describe the, the behavior of the, of the API. And then you can say, for example, if I call my API with this parameter, I will get um, a payload as a JSON with this uh, kind of format, with this kind of size, for example. So you can write as a, uh, as a user, I call with this paramet parameter, I get a 200 with uh, this result. And if you think about this and first approach of your API, that means before developing my API on my backend, before exposing my API on APG, I have to first design my API. That means I, I have first to create my open API specification as a documentation specification of what I have to do on my backend, what I have to implement on my backend, or what I have to implement on, on APG. Then, when you can, when you create this specification, in the same time, you can create the test of the specification. In your specification, you will say, this is my uh, parameter. This is the result I will have in case of 200. This is the result I will have in case of 404 uh, result error. And you can describe exactly the same in this testing language here to be sure that Okay, I have a specification, I will implement, I will deploy. Then I already have the test I have to run to validate my deployment. So in this design first approach, this kind of BDD or TBD, uh, test driven development also approach is something that can be very useful and very efficient for the integration testing. And you will have this kind of, uh, of result. So, here I'm in my in my project. So the goal is to say that I want to um, to be able to deploy my proxy um, in an with uh, automated automated deployment and automated testing, for example. As an example, I will use GitLab, but it's exactly the same with GitHub with whatever. In fact. Again, there is no dependency between APG and the specific pipeline. So if I look at my, uh, my GitLab project, I can see that there is different part in this project. The first here, this is the code of my proxy. So if I click on it, I will find exactly the same thing that I can see in the web UI. Uh, for example, the policies that are be used in this, uh, in this proxy. Um, I can see, I don't know, the, the specification of this, uh, of this proxy. I can see the test I want to, uh, to run against this proxy before and after the deployment. That means this is my project. And the thing that is very important, of course, it's the proxy itself and maybe the configuration associated with this proxy. And for example, here, I want to deploy um, my proxy, but also a target server object, an APG target server object, who will allow me to variable to define my backend as a variable in my in my environment. So this is a, a configuration file. This is not the proxy, but as I said before, this is some configuration I need to, to be able to run my proxy after the deployment. So. This is my, um, my proxy and this configuration. We'll talk just after about the, how I can get this proxy here, to be clear. 
Uh, I have to create from uh, starting from nothing, starting from a template, generating uh, automatically. There is different way to generate this uh, folder here, and we will talk about that just after. And there is different kind of uh, of file, and we will see this file uh, just after. If I look at exactly the same on my own laptop using VS Code, uh, uh, there is the, uh, again the, the proxy folder, the configuration folder that are here, and of course using GitLab, this is my um, my GitLab file. So in my in my uh, in my GitLab uh, file, we are uh, we are. Um, we will we'll scroll this file to, to explain how it works. The first thing is here you have um, uh, variables that define the APG organization and APG environment that you will have to use as a target. And also the host name that you will use as um, for, for, for testing, in fact. So it's very easy to deploy in one environment. And if you update this variable, you will deploy in another one. If you change this variable, you will deploy in another organization. So very easy to manage different environment as a target from my repo to this environment. So it's only a story of, of variable, so very easy. And as is very easy, I can also define a, a way to define, in fact, this variable automatically. And we can associate APG environment and APG organization to a branch policy in Git. For example, in my project, I have a main branch. And when I commit and push in this main branch, automatically I will deploy in production. I created also a test branch. And when I commit and push my code in this test uh, Git branch, it will deploy in my test environment. I created also a pre-prod branch again, and when I commit push in pre-prod branch, this will deploy in the pre-prod uh, environment. So you can, this is what I, uh, as an example, what I created here, I take, I, I use the name of the branch currently used for the deployment and then define the target, uh, the environment and the organization. So you can write it as you want, this is a, uh, for demo purpose, it's very simple here, but you can add this logic to automatically, based on where you are currently committed, then you will uh, deploy your proxy. After that, there is different stage, and you can see that we can validate the specification itself. You can run some static code analysis for both the proxy and the JavaScript. We can run some unit tests for JavaScript uh, policy. We can use, we can deploy the configuration, the hosted target configuration. We have just seen them before automatically. Then using the uh, Maven approach, we can build and deploy the proxy on this organization. And at the end, we will uh, run an integration test based on rule. I was previously uh, created during my design uh, phase of my project. So it's very easy. You can see that quite every time, this is only um, a, a command, a command line that can be used to validate my specification, run my IPG lint test to validate the quality of my proxy, validate the quality of my JavaScript code, validate, uh, run, sorry, some uh, unit test of my JavaScript. So you can have this kind of, 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 uh, of pipeline that it's very easy to create and to maintain. And if I look at the result of this, uh, of this execution in the deploy in, no, sorry, in the build menu of GitLab, then I will see my pipeline. And you can see that all the step I just show you are here. First, validate the specification. OK, it's green. Then validate the code of uh, my proxy code. It's green. My uh, JavaScript code is green, et cetera, et cetera. And we want to be able to trace and to audit the deployment. So you said that it's OK for open API specification. Prove it. So I just have to enter into the job, 
see the artifact that was generated during the execution of the job, maybe get this artifact here and have a look on it. And you will see that my spectral linter analyze of my, um, my uh, open API specification is okay. There is no uh, error. There is some warning maybe. I will have to use operation ID in my, um, in my specification itself, but it's okay. And I will have the same audit capabilities for all the, all the job that are here. Sorry, that are here. And if I want to be sure that the deployment was good, I just have to go to this integration test here. Again, check the artifact that was created during the execution and then have a look on it. And I want to test, it's an API to get some airport information. I just want to list all the airport. So I wrote these rules. When I call slash airport, I should get a 200 with a array of response of size of length 50. It's okay, it's green. I also want to test that if I ask information about a non-existing airport, I will get a 404 error code. It's done. I tested it. I run the test. It's OK because I get a 404 response code. So in one month, maybe, if someone told me that, did you test the deployment uh, on, this, uh, on this Wednesday, I can prove it. It's part of the, uh, of the pipeline. In fact, it's stored in the pipeline itself. And uh, I can I can show the, to the people what uh, what uh, I did one month before. Of course, if you want, you can store it elsewhere, not in the pipeline itself. Um, but I, I used to do to do it in this pipeline. So the, the last thing I want to to explain because when you start with working with APG, of course you will not create a full pipeline, full fully automated with full of tests with governance for all the people working with uh, with git and, and things like that but i will explain in fact the different steps you will use probably uh, using apg at the beginning it's not easy to create a proxy so as i said before you will use your web ui and it's perfect for that you can learn easily all the policies the, the logic of the, of the proxy itself the flow the conditional flow and that's okay after that um, from this uh, proxy editor, you are able to export the code. So maybe you will create the proxy in this interface, and then next step, you want to use Git for that. So you will create it, export the code, and then store the code into Git. And the next step will say, okay, now I can update the code using my ID. This is the next step. Now I'm able to define my the way I will work with my, um, my um, UI. I don't need UI anymore. I just have to uh, get the code itself and change one thing, uh, add a policy, change the backend, change the base pass, for example, and I will have the same. So you could use your local development instead of uh, the, um, the UI, maybe for the standard proxy and for non-standard proxy, you will have to use again uh, the, the web UI. Maybe also in part of your automation flow, you will want not to reuse something that you did on the UI, but to generate the proxy starting from the specification. And for that, we provide this tool, Open API to APG, that is able to create a proxy starting from a specification. And then you just have to give the name of the, uh, the YAML file. Of, uh, of the specification and automatically it will create these uh, folders and files that you can use in your ID. And of course you have, uh, yeah, you have, you can do the same, sorry, with APG CLI. So um, currently there is two ways to do the same. And of course you can do the same to be able to, ex um, to expose the SOAP backend so there is a whistle to APG command line that is able to take a whistle, your SOP uh, definition, and then generate a proxy 
to to expose it uh, as a as REST or as SOP into APG. So two way to automate automate the creation of the proxy itself. The next step will be to say, okay, now I don't want to use my IDE anymore. I want to create template automatically and maybe to change only few variables in my template. So we have some um, uh, template solution and to you can create some template or templatization solution and we provide as an example in the devrel uh, apg uh, github uh, project repository uh, a proxy template uh, script and you can say like that this is my template i want to uh, manage the resource not found to be able to manage course to be able to manage i don't know what token verification you define your template and you see, and you said this is my template and automatically this will generate a proxy not an empty proxy on the structure but the structure plus all the all the policy you define in your in your template and the last step maybe in terms of uh, uh, this is the goal that you will want to achieve in, in um, if you want to 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 give in fact the power to the dev, uh, application developer maybe in the federated model that means that the centralized team don't want to create any more proxy for the uh, backend developer and then you can create a portal for the backend developer and then the backend developer just have to come here upload their specification and automatically this will generate the proxy store the proxy in git generate the start the pipeline and deploy the proxy into apg that means that for a non-production environment of course there is no need of validation but for a non-production environment developer application developer don't need help from anybody from the centralized team to deploy something in, in APG and uh, they don't know, they don't have, sorry, to know APG. They don't have to learn APG. They have a centralized portal that automates everything with a very easy to use web UI. So probably you will have this journey starting with a simple way to create proxy and the more and more automated way to create proxy and maybe to give this, um, proxy generation task uh, in self-service to the backend developer. I will share with you, with you this. This is my GitHub repo. Uh, repo. You will find some exactly the same scenario uh, I show to, to you. Deploy uh, airport API with automatic testing for all this kind of pipeline. That means if you already have an Azure pipeline, CircleCI, GitHub, GitLab, uh, Google Cloud Build, of course, or Jenkins, then you can download this project or clone more exactly this project. And then you will have a starting point to create your automation. Just have to replace my proxy by your proxy, remove maybe the configuration if you don't need it, and then adapt the test, all this kind of thing. But you will have something that it's ready to use for, for training and maybe uh, as a starting point for your own pipeline. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. Also, thanks to Maria. It's like a really informative session. A lot of content again. Um, a lot of best practices there, a lot of different tools you can use. Um,